All right, uh, we want a bounded set of real numbers with three limit points. Um, I really like these types of exercises. Um, with me being more of a visual thinker, um, basically with these um, exercises like this where you're trying to come up with examples, you just sort of like picture these things in your head and try to think of what these things might look like. And oftentimes once you see the picture, um, the symbols that you have to write in order to make a proof follow naturally. Um, consider the set E, which will be set of rationals of the form 1 over n, where n is um, a natural number. And of course, um, when I say natural numbers, the way that analysts use it is that they say that 0 is not a natural number. Um, so the natural numbers, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Okay, so what does E look like? Um, so we have 0 here and we have 1 here. And so let's see here, E. We have 1 over 1 is 1, 1 over 2. Let's see here, 1 over 4 will be in there, 1 over 3 is maybe there. And like one over five, and it's just gonna start getting really dense around here. Um, so these numbers form the set E, and so we see that these numbers are all between zero and one, and they get really, really close to zero, but not quite. Um, so I claim that the only limit point of E is zero. Um, okay, so first let's deal with the case of um, X being less than zero or greater than one. Obviously from looking at this picture you can see that if X is less than zero or greater than one, then um, it it's not going to be a limit point. Um, but how do we actually write that down? So if x is less than zero, so let's say x is out here, um, what we need to do is we need to find a neighborhood around x which does not contain any elements of e. Okay, so uh, the neighborhood, um, the left bound will be x minus norm of x over two and the right bound will be x plus norm of x over 2 um, contains no elements of E. And if you're just looking at these symbols, you might be like, whoa, where did, the, where did I get these numbers from? Um, or, yeah, or you might be thinking, like, what do these even mean? Well, here's what I'm thinking. If you choose a number less than zero, then there is some positive difference or distance between zero and x. Um, and that distance is given by the norm of x. And so you can choose sort of like the halfway point between x. Um, so we want to form uh, an interval centered at x with radius given by half the distance between x and zero. And so it's going to look like this, and the distance here is going to look like norm of x divided by 2, and the distance here is also going to look like norm of x divided by 2. Um, because this distance here is the norm of x. Okay, and so in order to get this interval, the left bound is going to be, well, you start at x, and then you move to the left by norm of x over 2, so that's going to be x minus norm of x over 2. And similarly, for the right bound, we get x and we move to the right norm of x over 2 so that's going to become x plus norm of x over 2. So that's how we get this interval and we can see in the picture it doesn't contain any elements of e because this entire neighborhood is to the left of 0 and e contains no elements to the left of 0. Okay okay so that's that's for things less than 0. Um, if we instead look at numbers y which are greater than 1 then, um, and I should say the neighborhood blah 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 of x contains no elements of e because it needs to be a neighborhood of x. Um, 
but that's sort of obvious by our construction. Okay, so anyways, so here what we're going to do is we're going to do y minus y minus 1 over 2, y plus y minus 1 over 2. Um, this contains no elements of E. And again, this is a similar thing. If we choose a Y over here, then the difference here is, um, well, technically it would be the absolute value of Y minus one, but we know that Y is a positive number which is greater than one, and so we can simply write down that this distance here is Y minus one. And so we want the neighborhood to have radius um, y minus 1 over 2 in both directions. And so that's how we get this y minus y minus y. That's how we get y minus the fraction y minus 1 over 2 and y plus the fraction y minus 1 over 2. Okay, so this proves that any limit point of e must be between 0 and 1. Um, it can't be 1 because 1 is contained in E. And um, limit points by definition cannot be, well, okay, so if you choose an element of E, then um, here let here's how we're going to do it um, next suppose z is between 0 and it's possibly equal to 1 um, then there exists an n, a natural number, such that, um, well, if z is between 0 and 1, then it has to be between two numbers of the form 1 over n. So we're going to write 1 over n plus 1 is less than z is less than or equal to 1 over n. Um, because of course z can land on the number 1 over n, but it could it can either be, be strictly between two numbers of the form 1 over n plus 1 and 1 over n, or it can land exactly on one of them, which means that it'll be strictly greater than 1 over n plus 1. Um, if um, we let delta be Hmm. Here's how I'm going to do this. So we're doing this on the fly. Um, I, I, I didn't think about the case of x of z being in e being that much more difficult. And it's not really much more difficult, it's just more details that you have to go through. Um, yeah, that, that's sort of the thing that I like about analysis. It's, it's once you get used to it, it's not, a lot of the things aren't so much difficult, it's more there's a lot of things you have to do. I feel it, I, I, I feel like it's more of like an more of like an RPG than an action video game. Like in an RPG, um, there's a lot of grinding that you have to do, and it's not necessarily difficult, um, but it's just stuff that you have to do. And if you if you enjoy grinding, then it's good for you. Um, great, my battery's dying, so I have to plug this in, which is gonna make the battery super overheat, but whatever. Okay, so anyways, um, oh, but yeah, but, Back to the analogy. So in action games, like there's not a lot of like you have to be doing stuff all the time, and so it's it can be really hard. Um, but yeah, that that's just sort of like a pretty like um, not soup just a like not super rigorous analogy. It's just something that I think about sometimes. Like you try to um, draw 
connections between different things. Anyways, um, well, that's not important. What's important is that we choose an, in, uh, a, a real number between 0 and 1, which is not an E. Um, then, there exists N and N such that 1 over N plus 1 is less than Z is less than 1 over N. If we let delta, so this Z is strictly between 1 over N plus 1 and 1 over N, and there's no other, uh, there can't be any el other elements of E um, between 1 over N and 1 over N plus 1, just by the definition of E. So Z is going to be closer to one of these two fractions than to the other. So we want to make, um, so we take um, the minimum of the distance between Z and 1 over N plus 1 and the distance between 1 over N and Z. And the reason that I'm using um, like z minus blank and blank minus z instead of using absolute values is that we know where these lie on the number line and so we don't really have to use absolute values here. If you want, if you wanted to be super careful then you could write it like this just to guarantee that you know that you're talking about distances. So delta is the, is the distance between z and the closest element of e. That's what's important here. Delta is the distance between z and the closest element of e. Then, um, the neighborhood z minus delta over 2, z plus delta over 2, this neighborhood of z contains no elements of e. If um, if z is an e, then um, uh, z equals one over n for some n natural number, and if delta is the distance between one over n and one over n. Um, plus one. I'm doing this on the fly, so I haven't thought about which one's bigger. Well, actually, here one over n is going to be bigger. Um, it, it's important, like note that one half is closer to one third than it is to one. So one over n is going to be closer to one over n plus one than to one over n minus one, just because of how fractions work. So, it, anyways, if we let delta be the distance between one over n and um, the closest el next element of v, which is one over n plus one then um, um, again z minus delta over 2 z plus delta over 2 um, contains no elements of e besides z itself and of course Remember, that's super important in the definition of a limit point is there needs to be a point in the, in the set not that for, for, for something to be a limit point, then um, for every neighborhood around that point, you need there to be another point in the set which is not contained, uh, another point in the set which is contained in that open neighborhood. And that other point, it has to be a different point. Um, so yeah, and the reason that I, I like, um, just because I'm doing this on the fly, I couldn't see a quick way to combine these into one. Because if I, if I tried to define this delta as before and just use this z less than or equal to 1 over n, then the minimum of these two things would just be 1 over n minus c, which would be 0, and so this doesn't give you a neighborhood at all. And so, like, there might be a nice slick way to combine both of these two things together into just one things so that you don't have to separate it into cases of like what if e, what if z is in e what if z is not in e um, um, then there might be a, there might be a slick way to make this quicker I didn't think of it off the top of my head so this is good enough um, okay 
So there's only so every number that every real number which is not zero is not a limit point of e. Um, finally, for any neighborhood negative epsilon epsilon of zero, where of course epsilon is greater than zero. All neighborhoods of zero look like this. Um, then there exists some um, natural number n such that zero, such that n is greater than one over epsilon. Um, And then this implies that, well, if we take the reciprocals and we get um, 1 over n is less than epsilon. And 1 over n is going to be greater than 0. So 0 is less than 1 over n is less than epsilon. And 1 over n, here, let's do it like this. Then 1 over n is obviously an e. And... Um, 0 is less than 1 over n, which is less than epsilon, which implies 1 over n is in this neighborhood. Um, and we can find such a point 1 over n for any epsilon. Um, hence, 0 is a limit point of E, and so it is um, the only limit point of E. Okay, so just try to recall that picture um, that we had. Um, we had this set which lives on the interval from 0 to 1, and it has just one limit point at the edge. Um, and we want to set with three limit points. Um, so let's just put a bunch of these together. Um, finally, so we're going to let E1 be E. E2 is going to be E, and we're going to add 2. And E3 is going to be E, and we're going to subtract 2. So e plus 2 means numbers of the form, um, here, I'll write it here. So this is going to be numbers of the form e minus 2, where e is in capital E. And what does this look like? Um, so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So, so we'll Two there, negative two. Um, so e1 is again. We have one. We have a half. We have a fourth, an eighth, a sixteenth. Blah blah blah. We've also got like a third in here, and we've got a fifth. So we just got a whole bunch of stuff. And this is going to be e1. And now, what was e2? E2 is the same thing, but you add two to it. So this is e2. And then for E3, we subtracted 2. Um, these are not to scale or accurately drawn or anything. Um, let F be E1, union E2, union E3. Then F has exactly three limit points, negative two, zero, and two. And the reason it has three limit points was that E1 had no limit points except for zero. And so um, these limit points are translation invariant, meaning that if we take E and we shift it to the left or to the right, then all the all the properties shift with it. So if you shift it to the left by two, then 
the limit point shifts to the left by two, all the points in the set should shift to the left by two, and all their properties shift to the left by two. Um, and why did I choose two instead of one? Well, I don't think I needed to. It's just with these types of things, you want to be careful that these sets don't overlap. Um, I think in this case, if you have like E2 is equal to E plus 1, then you still have 1 being a limit. Oh, no, no, that's actually a problem. Because if you take E2 to be E plus 1, then 1 is not a limit point. It is a limit point of E2, but it's not a limit point of the union of E1 and E2 because it's contained in E1. Um, so that's important to note, and for this reason, I just, whenever I'm constructing counterexamples like this, you're always really careful if you, if you have something special that's going on in a set like E1, um, E1 is, um, the properties of E1 sort of depend on neighborhoods of E1. So, like, with zero being a limit point, um, that fact relies on looking at neighborhoods of zero and so you sort of need a little bit of buffer room around e1 to ensure um, that all the properties are maintained um, and so the reason I spaced e, e1 e2 and e3 out as much as I did was to give them enough buffer room to make sure that they don't like overlap at all and don't like interact with each other you want to keep them separated um, but anyways, I mean, I guess you could, um, you could write more stuff here to prove really rigorously that, um, these are the only three limit points, um, but, I mean, it's sort of obvious, obvious, because if you choose any point that's, um, for something to be a limit point of F, um, yeah, I, I guess maybe you would have to prove this rigorously just to like rigorously um, confirm that nothing happens. Like what you would do is you would take neighborhoods of zero and not only like you know already that neighborhoods of zero always contain elements of E1, but if you, you have to say that like if you choose a small enough neighborhood, then you can guarantee that you won't catch any elements of E2 or E3. Because you could think of... Um, Choosing a, what if you chose a neighborhood that was like super big, like here and here? Um, oh, well, wait, no, that that's fine because we're looking for a limit point. Um, but yeah, uh, anyways, we're basically done here. You can write more details, maybe. I don't think it, there's anything else you need to write here because, um, because be, it's it's sort of it's sort of visually obvious to me from here that like. E has these certain properties, and if you, like, put them together like this, then it's fine. Um, okay, so anyways, F has exactly three limit points. And in this way, you can see how, let's say, you wanted to have, like, infinitely many limit points. Then you could think of, like, um, let F be the union of all sets of the form E plus N, where N is an even number then you would just have this picture, but it would go um, infinitely off to the right and to the left, and you would have countably many of these things, and so there you'd go. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a really good exercise to get you thinking about, like, how do you construct sets that have set properties that you desire? Um, because being able to think like this is very important in analysis, and in my opinion, it's one of the most fun things about analysis is trying to think of how things could exist with given properties. Um, but anyways, that's all I have on this proof, and we are done.